as younger creatives, sometimes it's like, let's just create the craziest, like most fun work. Some people just like shut them down and make them feel bad. But instead it's like, let's get that out and like build something strong yeah. from that. So like they can feel confident to speak up. I'm Jake and I'm Austin and together we run 626 an LA based creative studio. Over the past six years, we've generated over eight figures in revenue and have produced content for some of the biggest artists and brands from Samsung to Amazon and Billie Eilish to Doja Cat. Join us in the green room where we go behind the scenes with this generation's leaders and talk all things creative and marketing. Today we are joined by a very special guest, Christian Ionello, a storyteller extraordinaire who grew up with us here in Los Angeles. She just started a new job at Saatchi & Saatchi, one of the biggest and most respected ad agencies in the world. She was previously working as a senior copywriter at Sid Lee and before that at Havas. All three of us went to high school together, so it's amazing to see this come full circle. Christian, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. So happy to be here. Uh, before we start, I'd love to just kind of give a disclaimer that I these are all my own opinions on the industry, and they don't they are not representative of my past company or my current companies. They're just my personal beliefs. Cool. Yeah, I'd love to just dive in and. I love just for anyone listening, if you could just kind of describe what is a copywriter and like what is the day to day of that job entail would be super helpful. Totally. Um, it's actually a question that every family member asks. They're like, what is a copywriter? <laughs> People like not in marketing don't know. Um, they think it's like law, like you do copyright law, mm -hmm. but no, it's very different. Basically, a copywriter is part of the creative team and we are part of the creative process from um, concepting to production, to editing. So within the ad agencies, normally you work with like an art director partner. So it's like a copywriter and an art person and you concept together and then you present your ideas to client and then execute them. So that's kind of the 101 of copywriting within the ad agency. Dope. Amazing. Yeah. Could, could you give us a little bit of a background of like how you kind of fell into this and like were you always interested in this? Did you think you were always going to be a copywriter or like what are your goals? Yeah, um, I have like a non-traditional ad background. I like have always known I was a writer. Like ever since I was little, I used to like write poems about my sister on like a pogo stick, make songs. <laughs> it goes like I still have the poems like Taylor on her pogo stick all through the town. Taylor on her pogo stick. I hope she doesn't fall down classic younger older sister but <laughs> um yeah so i like basically always knew i was going to be a writer and i wanted to write books and like have this dream and then i became an adult and realized like that's not a financial reality mm -hmm. um and in college i was studying journalism as well and i was like super passionate about it but like i hated like mainstream media and i'm like i can't do this as my job and i also want to make money yeah um so I started taking some copywriting classes and I was like, wait, you can like get paid to like make like fart jokes, like <laughs> amazing. Like <laughs> this is so me. Um, and I just like, I love the creative, like storytelling aspect to it. Mm -hmm. So it's still like checked a bunch of boxes that I crave, like, like my curiosity and my storytelling capabilities. And also like gave me challenges with like briefs and strategy, which I like, it kept me like going, which which was like inspiring to me. So then I was like, okay, I'm gonna be a copywriter. Like that's it. And then I was like, wait, you need to like to get an internship in copywriting. You have to have experience. But to have experience, you need to get an internship. So I was yeah. like, I'm kind. I'm allowed to cuss on here. Yeah, yeah. I was like, I'm kind of fucked because <laughs> like, how do I um, like get an internship? if like they're saying I need experience and I was really down like this was like my senior year of college when this was happening because mm -hmm. I was a creative writing major and I had taken I, I, I did creative writing and journalism and then added the minor junior end of junior year senior year so I was like okay I need to get this internship before I graduate and I couldn't and I was really down um and I didn't know what to do and I, I was just like okay I can't give up though like I got rejected heard the same thing like oh if you don't know anyone I'm sorry like it was just basically like this industry is like who you know mm -hmm. um so that was really hard but then my like the week before I graduated I saw like an uh an ad week because I was following them mm -hmm. uh and it was like from Havas in New York like Texas CCO an idea to change the world in six words or less and um if you know like you can be an intern doesn't matter your background like you could be like a teach like it can be anything 
So I was like, okay, this is the only way I might be seen. And I, I just like sent the text. I was like, this is probably like a PR, whatever. And I got a response and they really liked my idea. And then I, I was graduating the next week and they said like the day after graduation, they wanted me to move to New York for the internship. So I'm Wow, like, <laughs> I have chills. That's fucking crazy. <laughs> it was like wild. Wow, yeah. I didn't know that. So yeah. what did that lead to? So it led to me and Havas and I was on the Keurig account mm -hmm. and it was like such a new world to me. You know, it was so glamorous there, like just like a huge agency and, you know, the meditation room and all like the like crazy snacks and just like the editing rooms there. And like it, it was just so inspiring. I was, you know, really intimidated. I was like, I don't belong here because all these pe a lot of people who weren't in there, like who didn't do the six words or less, like had come from like you know they knew someone who knew someone and they had ad agency like internships before so I was kind of like okay well I know I'm a good writer and like that's what I'm here to do so I kind of yeah. put blinders on and and did that and then I well was, what was it like though like just coming in like not having that background like how did it feel and like what is like the first like week or two really look like when you just like hop into something like that I mean, well, besides me not having a place to live, like I was living out of my suitcase <laughs> in Chinatown on a couch. Oh my god! And then I, yeah, and then I moved to this like weird Russian like month to month place with like a shared bathroom. It was weird. So besides like not being grounded, yeah. I, I was like not grounded in my environment, also like in that like agency environment. But I just I had a lot of imposter syndrome, and I but it also pushed me to work harder. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's something also I had in Calabasas too, because like I I never felt like. Like, you know, that imposter syndrome of like a lot of people who are like wealthier than me and like do like have all these connections and stuff. And like yeah. my mom's a hairdresser and like a single mom and like we're not from that class. So like I, I kind of had that like that's always my work ethic is like, yeah. OK, like I, I need to work hard and like show like who I am and like imposter syndrome comes up. But I was able to just like work my ass off and and like my work spoke for itself. And I was able to like all the interns left and me and one other intern were able we were able to extend our internship for another month because they really liked us. Yeah. And was there something like you specifically did or was there like one moment where you're like, oh, I belong here? I think like it was one moment where it was the last week and there was like the going away party. It was like the company summer party. And like I went up to the CCO like I didn't tell anyone this. I just went up and I'm like, I want to work here. And I like met him. Like, And that's the same CCO that you had, much got the gig with right? yeah and yeah. i and like you know, and i was like you know what i and i had also like done a whole thing where we we like i was really involved as an intern too like i wasn't just like signing out at five o'clock yeah. like i did like extra stuff like a videos and like like volunteered for projects like sat in you know like i was really like like sinking my feet in there and then um i went up to him and i was like i want to work here and it was so scary like, i was shaking i like <laughs> before i went up the stairs i was pretending to be confident i was like Fake it till you make it. <laughs> like straight up. I wish I had these nails back then. <laughs> but um, I was just I like went up there and he was like, okay, like I've heard good things about you, and I was like, oh really? <laughs> and then I was like, okay. Um, he's like, but you know, we'll see what we can do. But I know there's like no budget on the team right now for you. But like you know, like we do really like you, and that's what ended up getting me the month longer. Yeah. Um, but so then. Yeah, like it was just I think that was the moment where I was like, no, I'm I'm good at this and like I deserve to be here. And before that, I was like very like I would call my mom like, I think I should go back to California. Like, I don't know. Like she's like, no, Christian, like you've always been a good writer. Like you're so good at presenting like you you understand people, you understand culture like you yeah. got this. So it was just like a lot of support, too, from like friends and family. Like, yeah. Yeah. And, and that what, turned into a full time job there. So the story continues. Yeah. It's my last day and like no one had said anything. I sat down with my managers, like my creative directors. I was like, you know, I really, and they're like, yeah, we love you. You're great. But the budget, like we can't hire a copywriter right now. So I left home that, I went home that day, like so mad, like so sad. It was my last day. And then. You thought it was done. Yeah. And so then I started cleaning yoga studios to stay in New York. I was like, I'm not going to leave New York. Yeah. I'm going to get another job. Like I'm going to do it. I'm cleaning yoga studios, like literally like broad city like pubes like i'm like in the like janitor style how long were you doing that for for like a few months okay and then i i go to a reading at a um a reading at a barnes and noble from like a professor from school chicago and depaul he was here for like a book he did a graphic novel and so i went to support him and his editor was there and i'm like 
hey, like I'm looking for a job. I love books. I'm a writer. I like I'm and I said like I'm cleaning pubes. <laughs> like I was just really straight up. I'm like, if I can just get an internship with you, and it was with Bloomsbury Publishing who published Harry Potter. Wow. And she's she gave me a call back and she's like, You have an interview. And so then I ended up working for a year at Bloomsbury on the editorial desk where I was like reading manuscripts and helping decide like who we should like pick and um, develop to like, you know, publish there. And it was so empowering. It was like, it filled like I would read like 300 pages a night and like, that's me. So it yeah, filled wow. like a part of me, but I missed some of like the energy of advertising and the creativity probably. Yeah. Like it's creative in a different way yeah. that, but like it was You're, like quiet. problem solving. Yeah. And like I helped make book, like I'm, I'm also like an art brain as well. And mm -hmm. like I would help make like the book covers and like do like book cover presentations and like mood, like it's so it filled that, but it was still like dimmed down. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I kind of miss advertising. And then I get a call from my old group creative directors and they're like, hey, like we want to, we want you to come in this week. Are you free? And I was like, I don't know what to expect. And it was for an interview. They didn't even tell me. They're like, yeah, we want to hire you. <laughs> um, and then I got hired. Wow. Yeah. And then how long did you stay at Havas again for? Almost two years. Wow. And then I I, I had um, a partner. They're like, we found this partner and like you would love her. And um, she, it was my, my friend Gown from Korea. And like we had such a you good. you told me about her. Yeah. Like we had such a good partnership. It was like my first partner that I really felt like we clicked. And we were like people called us the dream team there. Yeah. Like we, we got good briefs. And it was What really made it fun. work? Um, I think with a partner, like one thing is just like. I, I, I guess for me, it's every partners are different. But for me, like my criteria is like you can't take it too seriously. Mm -hmm. Like if we're gonna create good work, we have to have fun. And like yeah. we were on the same page about that. Like yeah, we won't winning award would be great, but we're not like we need to work till like eleven every night so we can like win a can lion. <laughs> yeah, I think it's better like focus on the work and the awards will come yeah. instead of focusing on the award. Because exactly. then you have the wrong, just the wrong mindset. And that's ego driven. And yeah, it's like, for sure. So with her, we were on the same page and we just developed like a really close bond. And we both like had like, I feel like taste is subjective, but we had like, like both like good taste and like similar. And like we were very different. Like she loved meat and I'm like a pescatarian and like she was from Korea and I'm from Southern California. Yeah. But like that also informed our work in ways mm -hmm. that was like so rich. And why I also like love working with partners who are like, like wildly different than me. Yeah. Did, did you guys have like the same creative process or how, how did that work? It did because like my, my process and her process was like, we both got the brief and we would get inspired not together, like on our own. Like we, we got the brief together in the briefing room left, say, okay, we'll meet tomorrow end of day. And we both like would just do our own process in researching like, okay, we have these insights from strategy. Now, what can we get inspired by on our own? Like go on, on Instagram, like go on, like in magazines, go, go outside, like just like find stuff, talk to people about like, if, if like someone, I think I was working on something on sports. Like I talked to my friend who loved college football, like, you know, like just have real conversations yeah. and then we come up with our own ideas, meet back and then go off of what each other has has done which was so helpful yeah and what what was your favorite project that you guys did over at havas i think like it was during the pandemic and it was with james corden and reggie watts mm -hmm. and it was like they had this like new brewer and it seems like it was like what was so smart about it was like okay we have this brewer that um has these new features and like we want we need to do a demo but as a creative team we're like we don't want to do a cgi demo like this is the pod like yeah. this is what it does like that's that's an ad we're like how can we make this like entertaining like a story content so we had reggie watts make music <laughs> doing the Smart. demo with james and like they improved it and like it was just like i love that project and we, we worked really well yeah. together on that like on i was just gonna say like on something like that uh like with your creative process like does that one just like come to you and it's it's like there or like do you did you get stuck on that and like oh even when you do get stuck like how do you get out of that and like dive back into it it does not just come. <laughs> you go crazy like you start what happens is you get the brief you you research you're, like it's your life and you dream about it and you like you can't get away from work you're in the shower you're dreaming like you're like with your partner like you're with your friends you're at a bar like you're writing stuff down like like we would like drunk call each other like I have this idea like, <laughs> like just like we were out on a night yeah. out <laughs> It's like, 
do you, would you guys like spend like a certain like a couple hours a day for example and just like pitch each other ideas or write down a bunch of ideas and then like you'd be like let's maybe flush out a couple of these like yeah we we would like so we go off on our own have our own ideas come back and then we'd be like we'd see how each other reacts like oh my god i love that that's great and sometimes our ideas would overlap yeah and the closer we got to as partners like we would come with the same ideas like oh, our, our thinking started like it's like it's literally like a real life like romantic partner like we started dressing like same colors like (laughs) it was just like yeah you but that's also like what's so beautiful and hard is like in this like industry as creatives we're always hopping around like you're at agency one two years and then when you if you have to break up like personally i always send my partner a crying pic like when we break up yeah (laughs) because it's just like it's hard but um what i'm just curious what is that reasoning because we always see it too like people are always hopping agencies like what what's the idea behind that versus like sticking it out and like trying to grow the ladder at one agency totally i mean i think it's a scary thing for old generations because i like i mean my mom's always like are you sure you're ready to move like you've only been there but as like i think creative specifically like we you know like we thrive on creating work and Mm -hmm. sometimes like you need to be excited yeah and like not even just that it's like you you made a couple of like really good pieces and like it's like you know when it's time it's like it's like a partner like you know when it's time like the relationship is you know you're ready for something new and it's just good to keep your work like fresh and like you know get new opportunities get new brands in your book because Mm -hmm. like you know as a creative your books everything everything to you so that's kind of the reasoning with with creatives could you explain like for those that don't know and understand like from the beginning what does the process look like like you go into the into a briefing yeah but like what does that involve like do you even have any intel like before the briefing even like how far back does it go before you get involved and like like, who's driving the briefing like who's talking to you guys in the briefing yeah those are good questions um i think so it depends on like where you're working what campaign it is like you know like if you're working for a brand that like always does this every year like you'll kind of know what you're going Mm -hmm. into if it's like a holiday campaign for like burger king and they do the same thing you know um but in like generally how it works is like the client meets with like account and strategy and they create what's called like a brief so it's it's basically like that like they have a problem or that they're trying to solve or they have a new product they want to launch like they have a business objective yep and then strategy works with them to inform that objective and give creative an insight that inspires them to create a concept that solves or addresses that objective. Yeah. yeah. And then you get pitched and then you and your art directing partner go and pitch concepts to your creative director. And yeah. is it just you two or is there like or is it like a competition with like you two and like other people and like who has the best idea? So advertising is interesting. It should never be a competition, but that depends on culture. So like the best teams that I've been on, it's not. And like, like obviously your ego feels good when like your the client chooses your idea, you know. And then also if the client chooses your idea at a good agency, you lead it. Mm-hmm. Sometimes if you're not as senior, so it's like, like breakdown and levels. There's like junior yep. copywriter, junior art director. Then there's mid level copywriter, mid level art director, senior copywriter, senior art director. Then there's associate creative director. Um, from both sides and then creative director group creative director executive creative director so in like a good like in a good team everyone's pitching ideas and like together collectively well they come so like teams present so like me and my partner would come in and be like these are this is our deck this is and then like the creative directors would say oh we like this oh like pursue this you know um and then another team this is our stuff oh we like this and then next round we all combined in one deck and then stuff dies internally when you present to account and they're yep. like this is too or strategy this is too off brief or at, at that point though is that like what you just mentioned is that considered like good culture like what's the difference of a good culture versus a bad culture at an ad agency and like what makes it toxic versus like uplifting and like trying yeah. to help each other out it's a big, big question <laughs> but i think everyone feels and it, it I, I think it depends on the person too like i think in my own is opinion. Is it like striving from like top down or just like the creative director on it or like where is that coming from? In Oh, culture? Yeah. That's the issue is like culture starts at leadership because leadership gives, like if leadership doesn't want junior creatives to present to client, then like the creative directors can only do so much. Yeah. 
but like a good leadership wants like like creatives to grow and get FaceTime. You know, like I was once at an agency where they wouldn't let anyone present the work except creative directors. So they would take your work and the creative director would present if they liked what you had. Yeah, and then and then they would we would do the edits and then they would go to client, but it was like they didn't want client to interact with more junior people. What why? It depends. Like, there's many different reasons at this specific place. I think the account, it, it was a lack of trust yeah, from leadership. Totally. Which, if you're running a good business and you're a good leader, you want to trust your team. You want to trust your creative directors to guide the more junior people and to step in if you know they're fumbling or, like, to, mm-hmm. like, interject to add the point that they might have missed. Like, that's that's good leadership. And it, it gets toxic when it's, like, hoarding and, like, keeping people out and siloed like that that's when it gets like like it it, then then younger creatives feel lost and like feel like kind of pointless or like machines you know like so knowing all that and now being that you're a senior yeah copywriter like how do you mentor and like lead your junior teams yeah i mean i i love like mentoring because like it's something that i feel like i lacked at, at many times at certain places and it was like you know it's like having a kid like what could you do differently totally um what what are a few things that you're like i'm gonna do differently now my position to help people that i was lacking or missing or someone did it for me once i'm like oh i really needed that yeah i think um there's a few like one is definitely like giving them the space to like express themselves and their ideas like like not like not letting them feel scared like if they if they present something that's off brief, like I'm going to be like, this is terrible. This is off brief. Like I'm going to be like, oh my God, you know, this is so interesting. It actually is leading me to this that relates to the brief, you know, Mm -hmm. like showing them how, like how to think in a way that's like, you know, like, cause I think as, as younger creatives, sometimes it's like, let's just create the craziest, like most fun work. And like some people just like shut them down and make them feel bad. But instead it's like, okay, like, Let's get that out and let's see like what we can use from there to like, you know, connect to the brief and like build something strong from that, you know, so like they can feel confident to speak up because I think at that level too, there's some old school people who will just want to like, you know, have it run very traditionally, like interns don't talk, Mm -hmm. like juniors don't talk. Yeah. And it's like, I want to be like, no, like what you have to say is as like valid as what I have to say. And everyone has an opinion. Yeah. Like it doesn't matter your experience because I know with my, tr- my experience wasn't traditional. And like I, I got from, from an intern in 2018 to a senior in 2022. Yeah. I, I'm curious just talking about like how you were saying like the creative could just be like off or it could just be like super creative. Like something I'm always interested in is like, at the end of the day, they they want something creative, but they're paying for something because they want to make that back plus yeah. more on top. Like, how do you find where creativity meets in the middle with like generating the best ROI? Yeah, and like, where do you like like pull and take on each side from that? It's a good question. I think it's kind of like what you're saying: pulling and take and deciding like your battles. And it's also about like having, unfortunately, like sometimes about having a good client who just will trust that you know what you're doing. And in terms of like, you know what you're doing, like you have to, whatever you do has to like be strategic. Like at the end of the day, it's a business. Like we're not just creating art for a museum. Totally. Like, and I think also putting away your ego is like, Mm -hmm. like sometimes there's business problems and we need to like solve them in a way that might not be the craziest and the splashiest and the sexiest PR thing, but it's also like, is what this needs to be. But we also have to push, like we can't get comfortable with like, Let's please the client so the client doesn't leave us. Like our job as creative is to make the best work possible. Yeah. What well, what do you think it makes like a great client versus a shitty client? I think like trust, number one. Is that just like they come in and they're like, whoever we hire, we're just gonna trust them because that's why we hired them or it's well, no, I think well trust is, has to be built. So like that's it's like twofold because it has to have trust from the client, but also the higher up people who like leadership. And like more like like CD level, like they have to have like that that strong relationship where the client has that trust, and also like a good client under like is able to see a concept without us like having like they don't take word for word like lit like I think some clients have like been like super literal like 
wait, this frame, like, what yeah. does that mean? And you're like, and then they'll shut down, they'll kill the whole idea because of something that's confusing. And it's like, good clients are able to like see the story and to like understand the creative process. Yep. And they aren't just like account mind, like they have to have a bit of that creative mind. Yeah, some clients are like very literal. Yeah. For sure. Um, Which inhibits them. Like it's it works backwards too, because they're like, we want to do this work and we want to make this stuff. But like, and they're trying to prevent like, like backlash and stuff, but it's like by pre trying to prevent that, you're not make, like letting the work. Yeah. So how how do you deal with a bad client? Like how how do you work with them to still create the best piece? Or do you think if you have a bad client, the product's going to be bad? No, I think like there's that's why it's like really important to have like a good team where it's like the the, the point of account is to get that relationship to like to like you know have a strong relationship with them and talk them through things. And the account is kind of the person like between creative and client. Like moderator. Yeah, like like they're trying to make sure that client's happy, but also like that we're happy with pushing it. So if you have a good account team, a, a solid strategy, it's like kind of that like that that backing to be like, hey, look, we have the strategy, like we you know we feel this way, we hear you, but also like this is the best option. Yeah, a lot of account account teams are like so scared of the client and so scared of losing yeah. a client that there's like so careful about of like everything they present to them. Yeah. And I feel like for work to really stand out, like you have to be pushing the boundaries on totally. like what it is that you're presenting and the work that you're creating and producing. Exactly. And that's also good why people move around. It's like you get fresh creatives who are like thinking differently and like yep. pushing that. That's amazing. I'm curious to just like talk about like the hunger of being able to make it just since it is such a saturated market and intense market mm -hmm. and very cutthroat. Yeah, there's a lot of money on the line on every single project. Like what what do you think it takes to make it today? Especially like just maybe even just coming up as like a, a copywriter and turning to senior copywriter, like what what needs to change or what do people need to be doing to, to get to that level? Yeah, I think um I I it's it's hard. Like I just think persistency, like don't give up and like like focus on your craft. Like you don't have to be like a certain type of copywriter. Like don't be intimidated. Like like your unique thing that you have about you is like what is gonna make you like make it. Yeah. You know, like that's What's your unique thing? Um <laughs> I'm I feel like I'm just really myself. Like mm -hmm. I don't have like a work person and a home person like you're just you i'm just me and also like i'm i'm kind of like not an ad person at all like i'm like <laughs> like i just think that not being that is also my unique mm -hmm. thing like i'm just a creative writer and i'm also like very empathetic and just like like love people and like love stories and like that that kind of just like helps me shine by just being myself and like not not sacrificing my values and like i like i speak up if if i see like something's like kind of problematic yeah for the client like obviously in an appropriate way yeah do, do you think coming not from like the traditional ad background and coming from like what you were just describing like makes it difficult to be in these like corporate environment at these ad agencies and like maybe like stick out like a sore thumb or <laughs> anything like that <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I think like, at, like, I think even though I, I feel like I do stick out sometimes, I think as creatives, like that's kind of our edge. So like, mm -hmm. I've learned that like, it's kind of a superpower now, but at first it felt really uncomfortable. Did you like try to change yourself to like fit more within the niche? Yeah, I always used to like straighten my hair and like, like at first I like wore blade, like I didn't know, like I would, but now like sometimes I wear blazers cause they're cute, <laughs> but it's like a different intention, you yeah, know? Like I, I just thought I had to be like this like professional, like. It's corporate, but it's not very like. Yeah, as a creative at least. Yeah. Um, and also, yeah, so I'm just like, and, and also when I speak up, like I don't, like I just say things how I say them. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious just cause we were just talking about like clients and the account people like do, do these agencies that you've been working at, do they bring up the model of like, I feel like a lot of people are going like brand director, brands are creating yeah. internal um, creative teams. Like, do you see benefits in that? Or like, that's the way of the future or you think they're doing it wrong or just like, what What are the pros and cons on each side that, that you think exist? Yeah, I mean, I haven't worked brand yet. So I'm speaking from like 
what I know and what like people have told me. Yeah. I guess what, what are ad agencies saying about that and pushing back on it? Yeah. Um, I think there's like, you know, been the great resignation in the ad mm -hmm. industry. And I think a lot of that is because, um, culture isn't working. Like we were talking about Mad Men earlier, yeah. like that unfortunately still exists. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. And I think with a, like being like brand to direct, like it's more like you, you are the culture of that brand you know like those values are like implemented within the the um the company because like they're like that's the one product you know mm -hmm. like that's the one brand that's the identity so like they want to implement that through like how they treat their employees and like all like their like mission and just like how they they operate and with an ad agency with all different types of clients like there's not like one like siloed mission or brand value like it's like you have all these different clients, all these different brands who have wildly different yeah. philosophies and missions different and expectations. Yeah. So, so it kind of brings like a fresh, like a fresh pair of eyes to the brand. Yeah. I think it brings, I, well, I think agencies like you're juggling, the pace is different. Like you're juggling all these different brands and there's not one like culture of like, this is Nike. Like this is a deep, you know, like it's like you have Burger King, you have like, I don't know, like, yeah. Yeah, so it's it's just like you have all these different brands and then the culture feels like it's hard to like then the agency's trying to define culture while also juggling different types of brand values and culture. So it's like And each brand has their own culture. Yeah. So when you're at one place that's just like one identity, one culture, I feel like they're able to be like more actionable it's where more like focused, yeah. Yeah. Agencies kind of like are able to be like talk about what they want to do, but implementing that on top of all these different identities can sometimes yeah get difficult yeah. are, are you ever on multiple accounts at once i have been at at havas and at sidley mm -hmm. but at sachi i'm only on the toyota account yeah so it's it's gonna be different. when you're on multiple accounts at a time is it hard to juggle like just because each brand i'm sure is drastically different in their yeah. culture and what they're looking for and what you're ideating and working on yeah it's 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 definitely like more like you have to like switch mm -hmm. like you're not just like synced like if you're on one brief you're able to like really like sink into that and like like live it you know like i was saying like you're in the shower you're thinking of it like you're, totally like you're talking to people you're reading stuff like it's always there but if you're like working on three different briefs and like three different accounts like it's a lot harder it's kind of like code switching like in terms of writing too it's yeah. like tone there's visual tone too but you have to like like be in that state of mind of what they're trying to like convey with their voice do you ever get like i'm sure you get stuck sometimes on maybe when you're ideating a campaign oh, like yeah. how do you how do you get out of that rut like where, where you're stuck i think i just like a lot of the times like it depends like i have to like sit with myself and be honest like am i stuck because i'm feeling pressure that like this is a big brief mm -hmm. i'm i don't want to fail like sometimes that it's like myself like I, I just need to sit down and mm -hmm. like I'll do this thing called the Pomodoro technique where it's like 25 I set a 25 minute timer and I I do work for 25 minutes and then I take a five minute break and mm -hmm. then do it for another 25 do you, minutes. Is that how you work all the time? No, or no, just no, when just you're like, ideating or when no, you're No, when I'm stuck and I know it's impossible like I know it's like my own f like anxieties like this is a really big brief like I don't want to fuck it up like it's it's i know that i'm like procrastinating mm -hmm. but then there's sometimes where i'm like generally stuck because the brief might not be that good and like there might be other factors in my life and in, in that case i won't do the pomodoro i'll like go on a walk i'll like go like watch something that like inspires me like listen to music go to yoga like i i just take space from the work yeah and then i'm like have fun too like i'm just like i need to check out and then when i check back in i'm normally like yeah. things start to happen did you figure that out yourself or like someone someone gave you like ideas and like one of them just stuck for you i think like the taking space has always been like what i've been preached it's like mm -hmm. when the work is too much you need to separate it yeah like and then the pomodoro i had this like productivity book and i learned it in there i was like oh we'll try that's it. cool yeah what what inspires you so much i think <laughs> nature is like my number one thing and that was actually like what i was missing in new york because I, concrete jungle yeah but also there was so much nature in terms of like energy like that's uh, and that what i'm so it's like i have nature here and which i am inspired by here 
but in new york i'm what i'm missing here is like the energy of like mm-hmm. the, the city and the people and like that it's um, slower pace here in new york is like a boiling pot and it's so yeah. fast paced and like and you look and i would always like i would have this series where i was writing like new york is it was like poetry and i'd like see something and write it and then my friend would like sketch it that's cool so yeah so it was like it was always inspired there like literally like kind of overstimulate like too much inspiration yeah i feel that yeah I- i'd love to know a little bit like you were at havas what made you decide i'm ready to leave and go to sydney and come back to los angeles yeah it was like so i, I was i always thought i was gonna like i'm new york forever like i'm a writer in new york <laughs> like, i fucking made it i'm not leaving i'm gonna fall in love here i'm gonna like live here and then the pandemic happened my mom was alone and it was really, really hard in New York. Like I was on Ludlow mm-hmm. and all like I heard were like ambulance. Yeah. There was like a makeshift grave near my, like it was just like, it dark. was really heavy. And I didn't realize how dark it was until I came back to like, cause my mom was alone and that's why I was saying I was coming back. But like, I think I really need to separate. I would like go into small spaces and I was always hearing sirens and it was just like really, wow. it was a really dark time. And I, I like started to think, I remember reading my journal. I'm like, should I go back to New York? I kind of feel like I should stay a month went by another month, another month. And then I got reached out from someone uh, who was like, Hey, I've heard good things about you. We're building a team at Sidley and you know, um, my old creative director who I loved. And he was, he was like, but the only thing is it's in LA. And I was like, this is the sign. Yeah, take it. it. I think it's meant to be. And it was for Dos Equis, So I was like, that's pretty fucking awesome, too. Nice. And I think it's just like you, you know, you do the... I, I just didn't want to go back to New York yeah. at this time. Mm-hmm. What, what was the biggest thing that you learned while working at Havas that you took with you to Sibley? There was a lot. Like, I think that's kind of like in terms of if anyone's thinking of like, do I go with a big agency or small agency? Like a big agency with a holding company, there's a lot of red tape and like bureaucracy and like all mm-hmm. that bullshit. But they're like so, it's like a well oiled machine. Like, you know, there's like all like, like so many production skills I got there. Like, like, you know, like just like director treatments and just like these skills that I was able to like comfortably learn because it, you know, it was so big that there's like that mentorship and there's like the chance to do that where like, at a smaller agency, they might just go with the more senior people because mm-hmm. they already know. And like, so the chance to learn all that those skills were great. If you had to take one skill that you would say was like the most important one you learned at Havas and took to Sidley, what would that be? Um, good question. I think it was just like, like confidence. And like we touched on it earlier, like not having that imposter syndrome and just like believing in in myself and like my capabilities as a writer amazing and then what what's it like now transitioning from that massive company more to like a a smaller company like sidley so yeah that was like a a hard transition because like we had like the editing bay and we had like our our production at sidley was like in montreal so it was just like you don't have any production in the states really no like we have producers from montreal who would like work with us so it was just and it was also i joined during the pandemic so it it was just a wildly different world for me um what what were your thoughts on working remote i i was like it was a lot of burnout like i think everyone felt it at the beginning Mm -hmm. it was like we're in this together like what are you making like did you learn how to make sourdough bread and it's like no like I didn't have time to make sourdough bread because I've been working from like 6 a.m. to like 10 p.m. every night. Um, Yeah. And like it's just like work life balance like didn't exist during that time. And I think we all got burnt out and like big companies were like, oh, like, you know, like we're in this together culture. Like but like no one was addressing like literally the state of the world. Like there was like like political uprisings. There were like social issues like there was so much happening of a pandemic and i think like a lot of agencies just wanted to like keep moving yeah and i think that's where that's part of why a lot of people kind of were like resigning and just like changing up their life yeah that makes sense could we touch on the director's treatments that you brought up earlier like when you're when you guys have directors pitching on on a campaign like what are you looking for in a director and in a director's treatment 
yeah so i think it really depends on the project that like like the brand and like what we're trying to accomplish like i remember for keurig we had a spot that was like heroic and it was like you're this brewer it was it was like talking about like ordinary people and this brewer was for like everybody it was like very like you know democratic like the brewer for all and we we had this spot that was like showing different people in, in different walks of life like enjoying their coffee coffee and like a very like super superhero like pan like slow pan dramatic like comedy so we when we looked at the director's reels like we would we would see like oh were there any spots that spoke to this and they knew they would see the script so they knew to like put in those spots of too so if like they had already done something like that or like you know like the like their style was like what we're looking for if it's like like match cuts like you know like what like so it just depends on the project so that's to shortlist a director yeah but what about like once a director is shortlisted and they're and you're finally talking with them and then they're pitching you their treatment okay what then what are you and your team looking for in a director it's the chemistry too it's like do yeah. they see the vision and also like what did they what are they bringing to because mm -hmm. i remember there was one for that specific one like he i think one of them had a stronger treatment but like when we met with him the one we chose like he just like had all these ideas already and like he had so much life and like he already had passion for the project and if it was bullshit it wasn't coming off as bullshit so it was just like it was kind of he was bringing so much more life to what we had already had and like he he took what we had and made it even greater mm -hmm. so it's like this partnership of create you know it's not like we're like this is what we're doing we need someone to do like it's like what are you gonna take this creative that we have and make it like even better like with your your eye and your vision and like how can we marry the two yeah like what's your point of view on it yeah exactly perfect word is there like a specific type of work that you lean towards liking like do you like do you prefer to like write comedy driven type yeah. spots like i think like i have two so i i like for me i love like humor and mm -hmm. that's kind of my thing and that's also like why i was like this new job they were looking for like humor type writers so it was, it was good for me um but i also like my journalism background is like emotional storytelling mm -hmm. and i've always like like loved like the nike like impactful like journalistic docu-series style um writing which i'm hoping to get into in the future but at at this point that's kind of like more what i do on the side and professionally like i i mostly do like humorous stuff cool yeah. J just to go back real quick to the director treatments mm -hmm. is there like one treatment you'll never forget where like someone just like completely blew it out of the out of the water and you're like wow like we need to work with him or i've never experienced or seen anything like that like I, any tips yeah. and trips tips and tricks that we can integrate into what we're doing as well I think like one of my favorite that I've seen is for um, it wasn't for advertising. It was just like someone sent me this treatment just because like I just like love so looking good. at this. Yeah, it was yeah. it was for um, oh my god, what is that? It's the music video. Oh, turn down for what? Oh yeah, have you the seen Daniel that? Brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. We love that one. Um, I just like that was just something I I thought was pretty fucking awesome. It's funny that it's a music video treatment. Yeah. Because music video treatments are, in our opinion, like very different than commercial treatments. Yeah. Because music video treatments are very like high level, but commercial treatments like you go into the details on everything. Mm -hmm. So they're very different. From at least like your perspective and just like hearing the conversations between like you and your team, like. Mm -hmm. Is there any importance behind like what company is backing the director or at the end of the day, is it just like, oh, who's the best director for the project? It's like, who's the best director and who has the reputation? You know, like people are like, oh, we want to work. We like these people make the best app, you know, like mm -hmm. there's it's just like also reputation, not not necessarily like who they're working with, just like the director's reputation. Has there been times where like you've said like this is the best director for the project, but we don't want to work with them because like said company doesn't have the best reputation and this person like could probably do a good job but it doesn't show as much in their previous work but the company just has a great reputation so we're gonna go that route not in my experience but like i know like we've had like producers who love like the production co you know like also we trust our producer so if you have a good producer who has a good relationship mm -hmm. with y'all like it's like oh we've worked with them they're tight like they're great like they're the best crew we've worked with you know like yeah. it's just like it's really is like like working with people and reputation like networking and like knowing who has their shit together and yeah has have you guys ever like chosen a director 
that you decided to work with and then like regretted choosing that director um yeah that that's happened i can't really talk about it yeah. but um that definitely has happened and also like during the pandemic there was just so many curveballs like mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a crazy story we we were doing something we were shooting like i forgot how much it was like 10 15 second videos three online videos one long form video like that was three minutes and wow. like like all this stuff in two days and so we would literally like film and then go in the trailer edit it and then put it out and like it was like it was really wild because it was for a wedding we were doing like it, it was just really for a wedding a dos Equis wedding and um it was a tailgate wedding at a college football game so we we're capturing this and then going in the trailer like it was just crazy but so we show <laughs> we show up to the the shoot and the first day and and the director had covid and they didn't tell us so everyone moved up a chain of command so, so who directed <laughs> one of the camera guys and it was like he's like don't worry i've done this before and <laughs> and they were great they were an awesome yeah. production company like love them nothing bad but it was also like we had we known that the night before when they did know like there would be different conversations you could have planned properly yeah so it was kind of like <laughs> love the it was a great experience in the end but also like there's been times where like well we hired this director we like this guy sounds cool but we don't know how he worked like it was just like but we had a tight like we had to get it out because yeah. it was happening it was like content rea like in real time wow <laughs> so, that's wild what's your wild. role once a job is like award and they find someone yeah what, what part now do you play from like the pre-pro all the way through delivery i'm in like all the pre-pro decks like because we have to run presented to clients so like with wardrobe and like with like the budget and everything like the producers take on the budget and stuff but i work with the art director on wardrobe and like making sure the scripts and like having wild lines and you know i'm i'm in all the meetings but the creative directors kind of run the show mm -hmm. um unless it's like our script and a good creative director would kind of like just interject and let like yeah us or like the acd team um go and then and then we were on set like we're we're working with the director and like making sure that like we're getting like the lines that we want and like the the cuts that we want and just all the shots and yeah. and like obviously letting them do their magic but just checking in with the creative directors mm -hmm. and, is yeah. your goal I'm, I'm curious what your goal is as a copywriter like do you want to become an, a creative director yeah i mean so next goal is acd and then okay. after that creative director just keep keep rising in yeah the, in the ad world so what what would you say the most successful uh, campaign you've been a part of is? Um, I think like personally, like the the tailgate wedding, <laughs> just because it it was like <laughs> it was a recipe to like not go well, and it we did it all, and the goal was to get like PR, and we won like a PR award. That's dope. Yeah, so it was like it it was just a, such a challenge, and like just personally and professionally, like to create that content and it was like docu style mm -hmm. and and just like have it be like beautiful and considering all the obstacles like there were obstacles like because it's at a college uh, stadium that we didn't know ahead of time like play, like we couldn't like film in the st stadium at certain places so i think like to do all of that like it was a big accomplishment for me personally yeah i'm curious on um just what what do you think it takes to create a successful marketing campaign especially in like 2023 and like with the recession coming and all that like mm -hmm. how do you have to think differently now yeah i'm i think that like authenticity i know that's a buzzword and like what does that even mean how but would you define that i think it, it it means like being being real to your audience and to like where you're at as a brand like don't be performative like and also like don't try new technologies just because everyone's doing it like what's the purpose of your nft like why like what's the function of it how are like your how's your audience going to use it like what value is it giving the brand what like what's the story yeah. rather than like we need to be relevant we need to be current like let's change culture like it's like maybe that doesn't need to be your goal like maybe you just need to create like content that makes people feel seen or like laugh or like it, it's just like being really smart about that i think like the old ways of like let's just make a cool ad and like let's let's just be a part of culture 
like it's not relevant like there has to be like a, a strategic reason behind it and mm -hmm. it has to like make your core audience feel seen and if other people enjoy it like that's also a plus yeah have you seen um like conversations taking place about with a recession and with like brands how they want to spend and where's the money allocated towards yeah. and like how do you have to transition now to really make it work with a uh, with the recession here i think we've we've definitely seen it all over and like i think high higher management like higher you know of course like leadership's always like everything's great you know like they don't want people to freak out but like you see it with clients and their budgets and cutting like like a big briefs that we've had have been cut like it's just like they they're just like we would present like they just kill the briefs and they save the they just like save the the money for media and that's that is scary because it's like okay if i can't do my job like what am i doing here yeah, yeah. um and and i think that's also like goes to like know when you have to take risks with the client and at this time like maybe it's time to play it safe instead of to push to try that kind of thing that pushes the boundary like maybe it's not the time like maybe mm -hmm. we just need to like be a little like smarter right now um and not take those risks uh so like that that's personally how i've been seeing it but like i i think like a lot of people i've talked to who are creatives like we've all noticed budgets and like briefs that like we normally have are different do, do you see like the type of content that brands want to push out like moving away from broadcast or long form on like digital and pushing it like going more influencer marketing on like TikTok and trying to go more like authentic that way how, mm -hmm. how do you see that just because like even in the music video side we've heard like some of the major labels have pushed like 40 percent of their music video budgets just towards like TikTok. yeah i mean i think there's always like now it's always a push for the TikTok idea like and i think at first it was like what's the the TikTok song like how like what and then is people like that was like what I'm talking about. People just like jumping on the bandwagon. Like we need to have a TikTok dance. We now, but like now it's like a little more smarter where mm -hmm. I know like, I know someone who works at Vayner, which I think they have a super interesting business model where they'll like do like, re like their content is based on like the comments. So like they'll create, they'll, like that's what their insights are. Like real people's reactions to like stuff on TikTok. And then they create like their brand products. Like, like interesting. It, it's a new way of working, yeah. but the content that they produce, like it always goes viral. Like the, the stuff that they make, it's really interesting. Um, so I think that could be like the future to be honest in the way that's more reactive and like informed by like, like the digital like chatter and like by real people online because I think- Yeah, it's what was the community one at the end yeah. of the day. Yeah, not just like, okay, what is this? Like, even though it is a human truth, like I think we're gonna go beyond a human truth where it's like a digital human truth. Do you see, like what are big ad agencies, like the ones you're at and like even just moving to Saatchi, like do they mention like stuff like they they might be nervous about or like adjustments that they're making internally to um, reflect the the changes in culture that are happening? Um, I don't think like they never, the, the one thing actually, yes, this, this week there's huge talks about Twitter, obviously, like, and I think it's kind of cool how they're transparent about it. Like a lot of clients are coming to us as like, what do we do with our Twitter presence? Like, you know, this is a big change in culture. This is also like a place that we're on, like, how do we show up? And I think like, just like finding out how to like, just like, I guess, be like, adjust to like these, this, these changing times and like, how do we show up for our clients and give them like what's best for the brand? even though like Twitter might have been a way to like reach our audience, like what is it now and like what is its value? So it's like, they're very aware of these like big things that are changing and they're pretty like on top of it, especially with such a big group. It's like Publicis is a holding company. So it's like, they're, they're like on it. Like they were in meetings at Twitter, you know, like, mm -hmm. so I think that's like one of the good things about a big company is like they're, when, when things happen, they're like quick, and there's there's higher level teams that are already like having conversations and planning for future and how to like support our clients and do you see the creative teams like being adaptable and willing to change for that or do you see some of these like older people that are like veterans in this industry are like no fuck that like this is what i've been doing for 50 years it's worked we're gonna stick with this model and that's all i want to do i think those 
people haven't survived and like i you know you think they're all gone now not all gone (laughs) bye (laughs) no (laughs) um no no no. i think that like they know that like if they want to stay sharp and like stay in the industry like they do it they do it with an eye roll though like there's a difference between i think like younger people are like okay like let's like let make something stupid on tiktok like yes of course and then like older people are like oh we have to use tiktok yeah but like the people who are like gonna try and use it in a smart way are gonna be the ones who are like running stuff so. yeah totally what what are your thoughts on like just with all the innovations happening like web3 like tiktok mm-hmm. blowing up over the past couple years like staying on top of like the trends and staying on top of like the new technology um, yeah. like how much time do you put aside to do that and like how much of that information you're learning do you use to like inform like the decisions and like creative choices you're making yeah i mean that's a really good question i think it's always like in this industry especially as a creative like you're always supposed to be like watching other ads like staying curious and like informed and keeping up with these trends because like it it changes so fast that like if you fall behind you're just like not gonna catch up um so i think i've been like trying to learn web3 and like nfts and like in that space but also in a way that's like okay i can understand the language and then make informed decisions from there rather than like make like scared like i need to be like a master of this and kind of bullshit and like pretend i know this it's like no know the basics yeah like know the language no keep keep informed on like how people are using it how other brands are using it like and then see how they did and like see what worked what didn't and kind of like just use it as like a study yeah and and keep up with it but don't don't push it off but don't like go so deep into it where you're like oh i'm the expert now like yeah yeah. do do you see a lot of people um just like hiring more of like these younger like gen zers and like just like the tiktoker generation and just bringing them in rather than like having their current people having to like research and learn about it like bringing in the people that are already doing that type of marketing like what's the influx of that happening i think it's a mix where it's like some people who are at like a level where they're just like higher level and they don't want to deal with it they don't have to because they are hiring these people who are hungry who are like oh i like you know i make nfts and i like code and like i do it for fun but i'm also like love to shop on depop yeah (laughs) they love like i think there's like a need for that type of talent right now and like they're they're getting jobs and they're and i think those people also which is different from even when i started are like making demands like i feel like like there's been like a social movement too there's been like a generational movement where gen z is more like i like they need me you know like Mm -hmm. where it was like what's the demands they're making i feel like just to be like seen to be heard like in terms of like diversity and inclusion like not not sitting for stuff where it was like some sometimes you might not speak up because you're like i don't want to get fired like i don't want to be the person in the room but it's not like if you don't speak up like you're doing something wrong where gen z is like no, like we're not going to be performative. Like we're going to we're going to call people out and we're also like going to mm. be the Gen Z's a little less professional or it's sometimes it's like frustrating, but also it's kind of nice because it's like be real. Yeah, it's be it literally be yeah. real. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other topic. Yeah. I'm curious like can you touch on what it's like being a woman in, in the advertising industry, like knowing where advertising stems from like we talked about earlier, like yeah. mad men, like It's it's the worst i'm not gonna lie like it's really hard constantly talked over like i i feel like in every meeting it's, and it got worse on zoom mm. but it was like always men talking and then like one woman would try and talk she'd be talked over like especially like me like i i'm a very like calm chill person and like i like i said like i want to be myself i don't want to like put on like this you know this thing so like when i would try and speak up sometimes like it wouldn't even be acknowledged and then, like yeah. guys would keep talking and like then they're like yeah, yeah yeah like oh my god dude you're so right you're so right and it's like a bro fest and then like the the woman would like slack after and be like cool yeah like that was just them broing out and like we couldn't even like get our two cents in yeah you couldn't get your point across yeah do you feel like agencies are are, are bringing in more like women to be part of the agency and, and on the creative team or even just higher level to help make bigger decisions <laughs> i think they they say they are and i want to believe they are but like i'm here waiting that. the action like that's also why i want to get to that level so i can like help change it eventually but every time like 
when I've left a job, it's like, oh, what could we do? It's like, oh, we need more like women, women of color, especially like in creative, like leadership positions. Is that something you'd like to, not not internally, but externally when you guys are like deciding on what director and production company to partner with, for example, on a project? Yeah. Like, is that something that you're looking for? That's something I voice. Like yeah. I know other people, like some people do, but I'm always like, okay, can we get like a person of color? Can we get a woman? Like, like just because like if we have the power to do this, like even if it's in a little way, even if we're not making an ad that changes the world, because let's be yeah, honest, those don't change. Yeah. But if we can employ people and mm -hmm. like let that their voice and their perspective, their point of view be heard, then like that, that's, that's our power. So like as, nor that's why I normally like love having a, like a woman as a partner is like we are always on the same page about that and like yeah. try to do that together. How but, often are you seeing those decisions made? Like there might be a guy who has like, the perfect reel for the job with us because he's been given every opportunity versus like let's take a risk and give it to this like woman who could we could really help like propel her career and give her the shot that she needs like so, it's, yeah it's, it might be a little more risky but yeah i mean in terms of like me and like how i'd want my team to be like that's where i would lean but like you know you only have so much say to an extent so like what, I what could are you seeing that. though um, like 10 percent of those jobs are maybe happening even if that i mean i think I can't say because it depends on who's the creative director in charge. Got it. Like, like there was a one creative director, Christina De La Cruz, who was awesome, and she had like a website that just had directors and like people who were who were um, women and people of color. That's cool. I can I think I yeah, still have it. Send it to me. I'd love yeah, to see that. and she would like you know if we were looking for something, she'd like send us this. Like, oh, this is a good resource. Like, just to have in your tool belt as you like rise in this industry. So like she was a leader who was into that and like at certain other places I've had like it was just like they don't care they're like who's doing the best. Yeah, I feel like just like internally you were saying like the agencies and brands mm -hmm. every company nowadays it like says that they want to bring in more inclusion. Yeah. And like a lot of times in briefs we do see the ask like we want a diverse director, we want a female yeah. director, but whatever. But I feel like I don't know. I feel like it still doesn't actually happen. Yeah. And I, th I feel like it's almost included just because it has to be included in the brief. Mm hmm. I, I mean, I agree. With you. Yeah. That's kind of the struggle with like just like how much you can actually do and like how mm -hmm. much is performative, like how much like these like I know so many agencies did like the diversity inclusion principle after like Ger George Floyd. Yep. And then like and then I've been on projects where every freelancer is two older white dudes. Mm -hmm. and it's like and then like i voiced you know hey for this project like it'd be awesome if we had a woman woman of color a creative director oh yeah like you no know, totally looking for that and then it's the same story so it's like how much has like that really changed it's kind of like feminine like you know like me too too like it's like that same movement where it's like there's been so much change in visibility but also like structurally if it doesn't change like it's still gonna exist yeah and i feel like that's how kind of is it's like performative still at not for all agencies but totally. a lot well, just yeah. to transition more to just like advice like just mm -hmm. the people who want to be a copywriter just come up in marketing especially like even women like what's something you wish you would have known earlier in your career you'd tell someone yeah there's so much and i've actually been reflecting on this a lot because i've just changed jobs and it's like wow like i can't believe i'm here after all this journey and i think what I wish I would have known is like, like you, you have a voice and just because like it might not be heard in a meeting room or something like don't stop trying, mm -hmm. like just like don't like dim your shine because you, you feel like you're not heard, like just keep doing it. And eventually like, like you'll, you'll at least you're staying true to you. Um, and also like if someone's making you uncomfortable, it's for a reason. Like I, I remember at one job, like this guy would always like touch my like, he's an older guy. He'd like, come and touch my thing, and like some, some guy across the way like slacked me. Was like, hey, like, like he was just like, hey, and like put his arms on me, and I like was That's always like, odd. yeah, and I just started out like I was like, oh, and he was like, that was really weird. Are you okay? And I was like, yeah, and he, I was like, yeah, it was, it was weird, and it was like, I wish that guy would have like reported him to HR instead of like putting it on me. Yeah, and I feel like anyone who's watching this is like you notice something weird like that or like like speak up mm -hmm. especially for like women because we you know like we're like 
in a in a space where like we're not we don't have that voice and it's it's harder for us to feel comfortable to be like i'm gonna go and say something because like you're like oh like i'm in this space and it like it was hard for me to get here like what if i say something you know and then you get in trouble for speaking up yeah and like yeah. so i think if other people can speak up too in terms mm -hmm. of not just like women but just like anything that's problematic microaggression like anything i think that's something that like i've learned and i'm like happy that i'm able to speak up right now but like there have been times that i wish i would have um and so like that's something really important also like in terms of your craft like if you like an ad or like if you like art or something like some like a movie or something like just like use use that as inspiration mm -hmm. and like if, if you like an ad and you're like you're not good at writing scripts like write down the script and like see how they did it like don't be afraid to like learn i feel like you have to be confident but a lot of time we're like oh i'm gonna like just pretend but like actually like be be like have humility be honest and like take time to like ask questions and learn about your craft and not be afraid like if you're on a shoot and you're like someone's using like like a a word you don't know like ask like you're not yeah. you're not an idiot you know totally. i think when yeah. you're younger starting out you're like i want to ask but if you don't ask you're not going to learn yeah i think that totally yeah. and ju just for brands from what you've seen like if you were talking to like a client right now at like mm -hmm. a brand like what's one thing you would tell them that they need to be careful to avoid to make sure that they're resonating with today's generation that's really good there's a lot <laughs> if they'll listen though so. <laughs> um i like i've said it a lot performativeness like don't just like like gen z like let's use gen z like lingo too like that like don't say it's given like why are you saying it's giving like yeah. why are you saying yes and also like <laughs> like no like like even if it's gen z they're gonna call bullshit like like you should use actually like gen z actually likes like sarcasm and like nihilism and like ironic like you know like just like s treat them as like people not like a group like mm -hmm. they're actually like yes they're like they're like in this time and culture and they have these like characteristics but they're also like not those characteristics like don't use those characteristics to speak to them because they're gonna be like anti whatever your brand is yeah and yeah just like in terms of action like i think this generation's all about action like if you're a brand who's like i'm doing like a green campaign like we're sustainable and you do an ad and then you have a sweatshop in india like you're gonna get canceled <laughs> I feel like yeah. that's a lot of brands these days though yeah like they like try to like put it out there that there's something that they really aren't or that they're pushing for this change that they really aren't exactly and these this generation is like very like bull like we'll call bullshit like they're they've been through a lot <laughs> a question that i have for you is did you imagine that we'd all be doing what we are now when you're back in high school but I feel like you t kind of touched on this earlier. You probably know, right? No, I mean, I'm like I said, I'm like so proud of you guys. Like, thank you. It's proud of you too. Thank you. Yeah. Like, it's really cool, and I think that's why, like, Calabas. Like, I feel like everyone I know from Calabasas is like doing pretty well. <laughs> like, they yeah. all have something really creative and like cool and like very like entrepreneurial. Like, mm -hmm. well, not everyone, but <laughs> yeah, a good sure. amount. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's like unique about where we grew up is like just like the environment and what like the industry that we're around is kind of informed like our drive and yeah totally do you, what do you see is like the future of copywriting especially like how much is like pushing towards like social media and just like disposable income yeah just like quick captions and stuff like that yeah it's interesting because like you see like some of like the ads that i learned about in school are like these beautiful like magazine long form ads like i have i collect like playboys like from so. the 60s and 70s yeah and they have like the best ads i'll send them to you but um but they're like long stories and obviously i love that but just like people just don't have don't the have, attention span yeah. six seconds three second buffers it's crazy yeah and it's kind of like gonna make people more creative i think because with that short amount of time like we always said, oh, you only have 30 seconds or a minute, but now six seconds, three seconds to tell a joke, tell a story. Like you're going to have to get like people who think really differently and like who, who aren't afraid to break out of this like traditional like 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 way of advertising. And I also think about like AI and how people are like, oh, if you're a copywriter, art director, your job's going to be replaced because I like projects at both agencies I've done are like DCO where you literally like plug in like lines 
and they they like it depends on different situ they're situational like depending on the weather like if it's raining you'll get this ad and like it's just like you just plug in all this stuff and then they like i'm just like is it gonna be like a plug and play in the future yeah i was just playing with like an ai like Script ideation writer. generator yeah and it's fucking crazy it is like we got a brief for something and i'd like put in some of the info and it's crazy what it comes up with what it have you seen the rupee what is it the poet rupee car and like it's like is it rupee or ai <laughs> no and you oh, can't wow. tell which one's her poem she's not a good po no offense wow. <laughs> that's wild yeah so like there's like it i feel like it's some i think in some agencies like things like banners might be like ai driven and so they might there might be less jobs like to be honest and like conceptual high level thinking like will be like more what creatives are doing rather than like like little like photoshop color correction like all those stuff like it might be ai like you'll have like a human eye at mm -hmm. the end to like check everything yeah. but i think like kind of to take time off of things and like save clients money yeah it's crazy <laughs> yeah. yeah that's wouldn't surprise me it's definitely where the world is going yeah not that i want it to i'm just of course right. yeah and there was like this one script i saw like someone i'm working with um now it was in their book it was so cool it was like they did the first they won an award for it. it was like the first script written by ai and they like they just put in like a bunch of words i think how it happened and they like made the script and then they shot it what the ai computer made so it was like four different scripts or something damn like that's wild so you still need a person to plug in for sure but like that takes some of like the conceptual and mm -hmm. like yeah yeah i love to know what the back end is on like how they even figure that out yeah. like, that's just crazy to me it's wild yeah well yeah thank you so much for coming on the green room we really appreciate it and it was super insightful and it was just like great to really learn about your role as a copywriter and just how how you view the industry and where you see it going yeah of course thanks for having me thank miss y'all yeah for yeah, sure of course appreciate it of course